Our Father in heaven, bless us as we study the Bible. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So you should have some comments because you've read uh, the chapters at least once. What did you notice in chapters 4 and 5? Or maybe... Four and five. Ah, four and five. 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 Four and Yes, he's telling us that God's will is that you be sanctified. That you know how to control yourself. Especially to control yourself sexually. Because that's a big part of sanctification. It's something that really distinguishes true believers and fake believers. Anything else you notice? Five, chapter 5 talks about like, how can we get ready for Christ's second coming. It sure does. It gives lots of little specific details. Some of the shortest verses in the whole New Testament. We usually have very good smells coming during class. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. It says that it's very important how we relate to unbelievers. And look at the verse before that. Are Christians above day-to-day -day physical labor with their hands? Sorry? Are Christians so noble that they shouldn't be doing like hand labor, like physical labor? Christian Raki, Adotai Rajokyoba, Adotai Bucho Podosto, Tetadir Hatiye. What do you see in verse 11? I don't know what to say. 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 I don't know Work with our own hands. Yes, it's a very important idea. I'm looking forward to doing some of that after class. I like to get exercise. It's good for the brain, good for the body. I don't get enough to keep my arms strong, but it's enough to make my wife think I'm strong. So there are two big ideas in these chapters I want to have a study with you. Now I'm afraid we'll really only get through one of them. But look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. <laughs> That's the amazing sentence. I mean, sanctification is a process. Does that process have an end? What does it say there? Does he sanctify us partly or completely? <laughs> 
এটা কি আংশিক অভিযোগিত করে নাকি সর্বক্ষমত অভিযোগিত করে সম্পূর্ণ সম্পূর্ণ না হোল সার্চ কমপ্লিটলি এন্ড দ্যাট সেজ ওয়াই এবারে that your whole spirit soul and body may be preserved blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ jeno komader obikol pran atta prano deho amader prabhuti shobhish agmon kale on onindoniyo rupe rokhito so i want to kind of describe this idea to you ekhon ami tomaderke e dhaona ta bomona kore bolte chai If you make a little graph. Tumra jodi ekta choto graph koro. That represents your spiritual development. Je graph ta tomader artik unnan rakhe dekhay. The dotted line represents victory over addictions. Ei je je dot to line ta eta bole hocche ashoktir upore joy labh kora. When you first become a Christian? Jabon tumi prothom ekjon Christian hao? We'll put this here. This is when you become a Christian. Eta ke amra ekhane rakhi. Ekhane hocche tumi Christian hoba. We'll put here when you are baptized. Ar ekhane tumi baptis honila? Uh you really have very little success overcoming sins before you're a Christian. Christian hobar age tomar pap ke joy korar khomota ashole khubi kome chilo. So what does this line represent? Ekhon ei line ta ki dekhacche? It represents that you will no amount of pressure will cause you to sin. Eta dekhacche je tomar upore kono dhoroner jor ashleo tomake pap korate parbe na. But that's still not the top. Tobu eta kintu upore nai. Well, what's this line here? Ekhon ei khane kon line ta ache? This is when you will do naturally the right thing jekhane tumi sadharon bhabe shothik kaaj koro so did jesus go through this process jesu ki ei prokriya gulo diye giyechilen he did ha giyechilen he says i say to find myself tumi bolechen ami nijeke bhobichhutto koro and in hebrews 5 and hebrew 5 e it says he learned obedience by the things that he suffered je tini bolechen je je somosto bishoy niye tini তিনি কষ্ট পেয়েছেন সেগুলো দিয়ে তিনি বাধ্যতা শিখেছেন but for jesus the graph was different than this কিন্তু যিশুর ক্ষেত্রে এই গ্রাফটা ছিল আলাদা he started right here তিনি শুরু করেছিলেন ঠিক এই and through his life he was headed to here এবো তার জীবনে তিনি এইখানে পৌঁছে গেছেন what do i mean by that আমি এটা নিয়ে তোমাদের কি বলতে চাচ্ছি i mean that jesus never sinned No matter how much pressure you put on him he's not going to sin. তুমি তার উপরে যতই চাপ দাও না কেন তিনি পাপ করবেন না. But as you make the right decisions. কিন্তু তুমি যত সঠিক সিদ্ধান্ত নিবে. It becomes more and more natural to make the right decisions. তখন সঠিক সিদ্ধান্ত নেওয়া তোমার জন্য আরো প্রাকৃতিক হয়ে যাবে. This is also the same graph that Adam and Eve should have been on. আর এটা হচ্ছে সেই একই ধরনের গ্রাফ যেটা যেটাতে আদম এবং হাওয়া They were created perfect. তাদেরকে নিখুত ভাবে তৈরি করা হয়েছিল. And as they made good decisions, they were becoming stronger. আর যত তারা সঠিক সিদ্ধান্ত নিচ্ছিল তত তারা শক্তিশালী হচ্ছিল. But there came a point. কিন্তু এমন একটা সময় আসলো. When they did wrong. তারপরে তারা খারাপ করলো. So before Jesus comes back. তাই যিশু আসার আগে. I believe. আমার The God is going to bring His people up to this point. The Isha tar log the be a point in Yashvan. I don't think necessarily to this point. Amar mona hoy na je oi point ni ami. This point really isn't very important. A point ta ashole beshi bhul bhul bolu na. It's nice. Eta bhalo. But what's really important is that no amount of pressure will cause you to do wrong. Kintu jeta beshi bhul bhul bolu seta hoyse kono dhoroner jor kora tomake kharap kaj korate parbe na. That's complete sanctification. Eta ke bola hoy shompurno pobitro kor. And the idea that we will come to this before Christ returns. Ei je dhaona ta je amra ekhane ash pouchabo Christer agomoner purbe. Is illustrated in the heavenly sanctuary. Eta মহাপবিত্র স্থান থেকে বের হয়ে আসে 
There is no more sacrificing going on. She is coming out to bless the people. What if someone commits a sin during this time? There is no process for dealing with it. The process has ended before this point. You can't take a lamb and find a priest to help you sacrifice it. So that's an illustration. It's also illustrated in the story of uh, Moses. Excuse me, I'm sorry, the story of Noah. The people had time to make a decision. But when the ark when the ark was closed, there was a time when there was no more decisions to make. It was too late for making decisions. So when the seven last plagues are falling, and that's a time when there's no more opportunity to ask for forgiveness. So you want to be holy during that time. And when you think about that, that could be stressful to you. But look at the next verse. It says, Faithful is he who called you who also will do it. Who's the one that finishes the sanctification work? Yeah, he finishes it. So in the verses before that, there are things that you can do. You pray without ceasing. Uh, you are the one that uh, proves all things. You, you rejoice evermore. Uh, those are things that you can do. So when it comes to the business of completely sanctifying you, Jesus takes that on himself. He's the one who can finish that. We're going to go out of Paul's writings for a moment and see what Peter says about Paul's writings. And then we'll come back to what Paul said. Look at 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3 is also about Christ's coming. And uh, we will start in verse uh, 10. Verse uh, 10. কিন্তু প্রভুর দিন চরে নেই আসবে তখন আকাশমণ্ডল পুরু শব্দ করিয়া যাইবে এবং মূল বস্তু সকল পুরিয়া গিয়া বিলীন হইবে এবং পৃথিবী ও তার মধ্যবর্তী কার্য সকল পুরিয়া যাইবে What does it mean like a thief? এই যে যে চোরের মত আসবে এটা অর্থ কি? If you have a huge house তোমার যদি একটা বড় ঘর থাকে It's possible that when you sleep in one room a, a a thief could sneak in and steal from a different room. But if you, if you live in a little one-room house, a thief is not going to be able to sneak in and steal something. If he wants to take your stuff, he's going to have to overpower you. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, Jesus was referring to the second idea. He was saying that when he comes back, people aren't expecting him, but they're going to be overwhelmed by the great power and noise that's happening. 
This really doesn't sound like a secret rapture. You understand. Verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what type of people should you be in all holy conduct and godliness? He says the fire is going to burn up the world. <coughs> so do you think you ought to be a holy person? Yes. Verse 12. Looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved. Being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. We just read the whole verse 12. He said, you can make the day of Jesus come sooner. But you need to have that holiness. Look at verse 14. Therefore, beloved, Look at look forward to these looking forward to these things. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. When Jesus comes back, what's he looking for? He's looking for people who are blameless. With no spot. That's Peter's way of saying what we just read Paul say. Paul said completely sanctified. Peter said without spot and blameless. And they're both referring to the time when Jesus comes back. Verse 15. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. That is, God is patiently waiting for us to go through this process. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Has Paul written about this experience? Peter says yes. And I've showed it to you already. Look at the next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. When I found that, I was interested in it. I went back to look through Paul's epistles. See, does he speak about getting ready for Christ's coming in all the epistles? Does he speak about being holy in all of them? And I found the answer to be yes. And then he says, in some of those epistles are things hard to understand. Can I read over 16? So when you're meeting with new Christians or not yet Christians next week, is it good to have them start with Paul's writings? This verse says no. Uh, better start with the writings of Peter and James and the Gospels. Start with 
Proverbs and Psalms and Deuteronomy and Genesis. Maybe go to the book of Acts. But save Paul's writings for later. Because what are the kind of people that twist them and end up being lost? It says the ones that are not educated. Those that aren't stable. And those are the same ones that we're talking about. So, I'm going to show you some of the passages where Paul talks about getting ready for Christ's coming. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3. This is right in our, our study center. I mean, the, the book we're studying. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 12. And may the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and to all and just as we do towards you. So there's love growing. It's growing three directions. From Paul and the leaders to the people is growing. And between the brothers is growing. And between the brothers and those on the outside is growing. All three are growing at the same time. And you notice who makes the love grow in verse 12? What does it say? Who's making the love grow? God. Yeah, God is the farmer. He's making the love grow. Verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. You read the whole verse, right? So when you put those two verses together, it says that the Father wants you to be ready when Jesus comes back. So what is he doing? He's making your love grow. It makes me think of other verses. Jesus talked about the end of time. He said, because iniquity will be all over the place, love will be shrinking. But Jesus says your love needs to be growing. So either you're getting ready for Christ to come or you're becoming less ready for Him. Do you have any questions about this? Do you see in verse 13 the word blameless? What is last generation theology? It's the idea that Jesus is going to completely sanctify people as a process before Jesus returns. It's the idea that that's the work he's doing. Let's look at a few more verses. Look back at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27. Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27. 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Ephesians 5. Yes, 25. And why did Jesus give himself? Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word. So when Jesus died, and so he could give the church a good cleaning. And he's using the Bible to do the cleaning. When you're cleaning, how do you know when you're done? That's a hard question. If you're a perfectionist, cleaning probably isn't a job you should do for a livelihood. Because you can just always be clean. But Jesus does have a goal. Look at verse 27. That he may present her to himself. Okay, but I need to talk about the pieces. Oh, because they're like together. So you can just read the whole verse, then I'll talk about it. So Jesus is getting his bride ready. Ready to marry him. And how does he want her to look? Beautiful. Glorious. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Holy and with no blemish. So that's when does he see his bride? That's at the second come. So this is the same thing we read about in the other passages. Jesus is cleaning up the church. He's using the word of God to do it. And what is he aiming for? He's aiming that the church will be ready when Jesus returns. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. These are places we've already looked. First Corinthians 1. We start in verse 5. It says, You were enriched by Jesus in everything. Verses 5 and 6 are talking about the gift of prophecy. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And why is that gift being given? Verse 7. It says, so that you will be lacking no gift while you're waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 8. Who will also confirm you until the end. That you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does that verse say? Jesus wants you to, to be blameless when you return. He wants the church to be that way. So he gives that gift of prophecy. So that the church can be ready. So what Peter said is that Paul talks about this in all his epistles. And we've already read about it in most of them. We read in 2 Corinthians that we should be perfected holiness in the fear of God. And 
We read in Colossians that Christ in us is the hope of glory. We saw in Philippians that he will complete the work until the day that he appears. Yeah, Philippians 1.6. So what Peter said is true. Paul talks about these things in all his epistles. But there are some people who really believe that this idea is false. They fight it. And if they were sitting here, they might be boiling already. If I said you can talk, they might say some things. So I'll say a little bit for them. They would say, this idea isn't in the Bible. You got it from Ellen White. And I would say, in this class we've just been looking at the Bible. All the verses we looked at are in the Bible. Did I show you anything from Ellen White in this class? Was it Ellen White or Paul that said that we'll be wholly sanctified or completely sanctified? That was Paul. So it's a false idea that it comes from Ellen White. But he still might be angry. And he might say, you're making a works-oriented religion. You're taking the focus off Jesus and putting it on us. And I would kind of scrunch up my face a bit. I'd say, who is it that does the sanctifying? It's Jesus. Jesus. Who is cleaning up the bride? That's Jesus. What's that gift of prophecy called? It's the testimony of Jesus. Uh, the Bible teachings are true. And everything honors Jesus. Someday you're going to see a, a child that's very obedient. Maybe Tamar is one of those. If you see that Tamar has a good character, that's a little bit of honor to Tamar. But it's mostly honor to Ben and Leah. And that's what the Bible says about this. It says that God gets honor through the church. Jesus said the same idea. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Your Father in Heaven. That only makes sense if God is honored by the things He does in us. Someone might add another objection. They might say, What if God is not able to accomplish this? Does that mean Moses has to go back to earth and die? I mean, what if this can't be accomplished? Does Enoch have to come back? Does Enoch have to come down from heaven? 
And when they say things like this, <coughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. <coughs> but I understand why they say it. <coughs> Let me see if I can illustrate it for you. <coughs> if I said to you, <coughs> we're going to plant date palms here tomorrow, <coughs> tomorrow you'd be looking for if we do it, that would mean that my word is more reliable. If we don't do it, it means my word is less reliable. You evaluate people that way. So you know some people who are reliable and some people who aren't. Don't you know people like that? Yeah, I know people like that too. And uh, what about God? Is he reliable? A hundred percent. So if he says he's going to sanctify us completely, and he doesn't do it, that's a disaster. The stability of the universe is at stake. Uh, Why? Because the universe is built on the fact that you can trust God. It's not because last generation is so important. It's because God's words are so important. So everything he says must happen. But there's nothing to worry about. Everything he says will happen. So it's not, it's not a stress. Uh, a friend of mine wrote a book. It's called God at Risk. It's not a bad book, but I think it's not wisely named. I mean, when Jesus came to earth, he took a risk, but before he came, he knew what he was going to do. It wasn't a random risk. He knew what was going to be the result. God has a plan. He's going to accomplish it. And that's an honor to him. And this is part of the plan. Someone might say, how can he completely sanctify people? They might say to you, are you completely sanctified? Are you completely sanctified? And if you say yes, you've got a problem. Right? I mean, was a pretty holy man. He said, if I say I'm perfect, it would prove me perverse. But what does God say about him in the first chapter? He says, look at Job, he's perfect. So Job couldn't say it about himself. But God said it about him. And when Satan put him under terrible pressure, did he ever cuss God, swear to swear at God and give up? No. Do you have any questions about this topic? I might have time to get to the second topic. Nope. So, Ellen White does say some things about this. But she's really just commenting on the verses we already read. 
She describes God as as a farmer. It says that when his people grow to reflect his character, he'll come back and take them. But that same idea is in the Bible already. John saw that before Jesus comes back, the people must be sealed. And what is that sealing? It's the process or the process of writing God's principles into our heart. So no one will be sealed while they have a spot or stain. That sealing represents being settled into the truth in a way so that whether it's Let's try to start that sentence over. The sealing is a settling process. When you're sealed, it means that you're very thoroughly settled. In two different ways. One, you're settled in a spiritual sense. No uh, temptation is going to push you over into sin. And one, you're settled in a mental sense. No, no deception is going to push you off the truth. Those two things go together. Alright, well I've said the same thing about five different ways. So I think I will just speak a little bit about the second thought. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. This is where Paul talks about how Christians deal with death. Chapter 4, verse 13. I'm glad you're there before me. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, about those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who do not have hope. When he says sleep there, what's he talking about? The people who are sleeping. Uh, and, and people who die, dead people. Yeah, this is the metaphor for death. Paul didn't invent the metaphor. It's used by almost all the prophets. Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive to remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. So he's saying that when Jesus comes back, both the those that are in the graves and those that are alive are going to see him. And you might say, how? How can those in the grave see him? But he already partly answered. He said Jesus died and was resurrected. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
কারণ প্রভু স্বয়ং আনন্দ ধ্বনি সহ প্রধান ভূতের রব সহ এবং ঈশ্বরের তুরিবাদ্য সহ স্বর্গ হইতে নামিয়ে আসিবেন এবং যাহারা খ্রিস্টে মরিয়াছে তাহারা প্রথমে উঠে So that's the resurrection. So, eta hotche punorutthan. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Pore amra jahara jibito achi jara obosho thakibo amra akashe prabhu shohit shakhat korbar nimitto ekshonge tahar shohit melko jokke nimitto hoybo. And thus we will ever be with the Lord. Er ei rupe shoto to prabhu shonge thaki. Comfort one another with these words. <coughs> so this is Paul talking about death. He says, "Be comforted." There's hope. There's going to be a resurrection of the righteous. So look at this passage carefully. Let's say your phone makes an alarm. And you look at it and it's an emergency message from the Bangladesh uh, government. And it says Jesus is in Dhaka. And he invites everyone to come meet him. All cars and buses and everyone should be coming. Are you going to go? No. Not if you read this passage well. In this passage, does Jesus touch the earth? No. He's in the air. The dead rise to him first. Then those that have never died that are righteous rise and join them. So he doesn't touch the earth here. So if Satan pretends to be him, and is in some place, Jesus said, don't go. He warned us. Excuse me, I think you understand. It's too bad when your teacher yawns during class. <laughs> I want to blame them one of you, but I don't think I should. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I should. I think it wouldn't be appropriate. I should be able to bear my own weariness. So, your assignment is to read 2 Thessalonians. It's a shorter book. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. And uh, maybe we'll say a few more things about death tomorrow. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for comforting words. Bless us with wisdom. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.